Every summer, the island of Sodor is very busy. Holiday makers love to sightsee, and when the weather is fine, there is no better place to visit. Some people like to go to the mountains. Others like the valleys. Children love the seaside. One morning, Thomas was puffing along the line that runs by the coast. His two coaches, Annie and Clarabelle, were packed with children going to the beach. Everyone was happy. Percy was taking some freight cars to the harbor. Hello, Thomas. You look cheerful. I wish I could take children today instead of freight cars. They're the vicar's Sunday school, explained Thomas. I'm busy this evening, but the station master says I can ask you to take the children home. Of course I will, promised Percy. Later, Percy saw Harold. Sorry, Percy. Can't talk. I'm on high alert. Why? Bad weather's due. My help's always needed. Mind how you go, Percy. Huh, <laughs> huffed Percy. As long as I've got rails to run on, I can go anywhere, in any weather, anyhow. Goodbye. Be careful, warned Edward. There's a storm coming. A promise is a promise, thought Percy, no matter what the weather. The children had a lovely day, but by tea time, dark clouds loomed ahead. Annie and Clarabelle were glad when Percy arrived. He was just in time. The rain streamed down Percy's boiler. Ugh, he shivered and thought of his nice dry shed. Percy struggled on past coastal villages and into the countryside. The river was rising fast. I wish I could see, I wish I could see, complained Percy as he battled against the rain. More trouble lay ahead. hissed Percy. The water is sloshing my fire. Percy's driver and fireman had to find some more firewood. I'll have some of your floorboards, please, said the fireman to the conductor. I only swept the floor this morning, grumbled the conductor, but he still helped. Soon, Percy's fire was burning well. He felt warm and comfortable again. Then he saw Harold. Oh, dear, thought Percy. Harold's come to laugh at me. Something thudded onto Percy's boiler. Ow! exclaimed Percy. He needn't throw things. It's a parachute, laughed his driver. Harold's dropping hot drinks for us. Thank you, Harold, whistled Percy. Good to be of service, replied Harold and buzzed away. The water lapped Percy's wheels. Percy was losing steam again, but he plunged bravely on. I promised, he panted. I promised. He made one more big effort, and at last, exhausted but triumphant, he brought the train home. Well done, Percy, cheered Thomas. You kept your promise, despite everything. Sir Topham had arrived in Harold. First he thanked the men, then Percy. Harold told me you were a, a wizard. He said he can beat you at some things, but not at being a submarine. I don't know what you two get up to sometimes, but I do know that you're a really useful engine. Oh, sir, whispered Percy happily. Scarloe had been to the works to be mended. He felt much better. Rusty the Diesel was helping him off his rail car. Scarloe hadn't met the little Diesel before. Rusty seems a kindly sort of engine, he thought to himself. I help to mend the line and do odd jobs, explained Rusty. I hear everyone is looking forward to seeing you again. Come on.
Peter's Sam was feeling depressed. He was still getting over his accident, but he wanted to start work again. Sir Topham Hatt wouldn't let him. Another day's rest will do you good, he said. Besides, I've got a surprise for you. For me, sir? How nice, sir. What is it, sir? Wait and see. The surprise was Scarloe. Oh, said Peter Sam, I'm glad you've come home. They lit Scarloe's fire and he sizzled happily. I feel all excited, he said, just like a young engine. Now tell me all the news. I see you've met Rusty, said Peter Sam. Yes, I like that diesel. So do I, replied Peter Sam. It's a pity Duncan doesn't. Who is Duncan? He came as a spare engine after my accident, replied Peter Sam. Is he useful? He keeps busy, and I'm sure he means well, but he's bouncy and rude. He sings and sways and swivels around. His drivers call it rock and roll. I understand, said Scarloe gravely. His driver interrupted. Duncan has done it again. He's stuck in a tunnel. Come on, old boy, we'll have to get him out. Scarloe was pleased. He wanted to run and looked forward to meeting Duncan. They found the caboose and some workmen and hurried up the line. How nice and smooth the rails are, thought Scarloe. They've mended all the old bumps. The little diesel has helped to do that. What a difference Rusty's made to the line. Quite soon, they found Duncan. He was stuck at the far end of the tunnel, and he was very cross. I'm a plain, blunt engine. I speak as I find. Tunnels should be tunnels and not rabbit holes. This railway is no good at all. Don't be silly, snapped his driver. This tunnel is quite big enough for engines who don't rock and roll. It took a long time to clear away the rocks and set Duncan free again. At last, Scarloe was able to push Duncan and his coaches safely through. The caboose was left on the siding, and the workmen stayed to make sure everything was safe. Duncan grumbled all the way home, but Scarloe paid no attention. Later, Sir Topham Hatt spoke severely to Duncan. Listen to me. There is nothing wrong with that tunnel. You stuck in it because you tried to do rock and roll. Tunnels are not dance floors, and you are not a pop star. Then Sir Topham Hatt gave his full attention to Duncan's funnel. If it happens again, he ended ominously, I shall find ways to cut you down to size. In other words, your career is <clears throat> on the line. Need I say more? Duncan thought Sir Topham Hatt had said quite enough, and he remained completely silent and still for at least a whole evening. Duck, the great western engine, worked hard in the yard at the big station. Sometimes he pulled coaches. Sometimes he pushed freight cars, but whatever the work, Duck got the job done without fuss. One day, Duck was resting in the shed when Sir Topham Hatt arrived. Your work in the yard has been good. Would you like to have a branch line for your own? Yes, please, sir, replied Duck. So Duck took charge of his new branch line. The responsibility delighted him. The line runs along the coast by sandy beaches till it meets a port where big ships come in. Duck enjoyed exploring every curve and corner of the line. Sea breezes swirled his smoke high into the air and his green paint glistened in the sunlight. 
This is just like being on holiday, he puffed. Well, you know what they say, laughed his driver. A change is as good as a rest. Soon, Duck was busier than ever. Sir Topham Hatt was building a new station at the port. Duck pulled the heavy freight cars wherever they were needed. Bertie looked after Duck's passengers and the other engines helped too, but the work took a long time. Noise and dust filled the air. Don't worry, whistled Toby. The station's nearly finished. And on time, too, said Duck thankfully. Duck felt his responsibility deeply and talked endlessly about it. You don't understand, Donald, how much Sir Topham Hatt relies on me. Ach, ay, muttered Donald sleepily. I'm Great Western, and I... Quack, quack, quack. What? Ye heard? Quack, quack, ye go. Sounds like ye're an egg laid. Now wheesht and let an engine sleep. Quack yourself, said Duck indignantly. Later, he spoke to his driver. Donald says I quack as if I'd laid an egg. Quack, do you? pondered his fireman. He whispered something to Duck and his driver. They were going to play a joke on Donald and pay him back for teasing Duck. The engines were busy for the rest of the day and nothing more was said. Not even a quack. But when at last Donald was asleep, Duck's driver and fireman popped something into his water tank. Next morning, when Donald stopped for water, he found that he had an unexpected passenger aboard. A small white duckling popped out of his water tank. Now, do, who's behind this? laughed Donald. The duckling was tame. She shared the fireman's sandwiches and rode in the tender. The other engines enjoyed teasing Donald about her. Presently, she grew tired of traveling and hopped off at a station, and there she stayed. That night, Donald's driver and fireman got busy, and in the morning, when Duck's crew arrived to look him over, they laughed and laughed. Look, Duck, look what's under your bunker. It's a nest box with an egg in it. Donald opened a sleepy eye. Well, 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 ye must have laid it in the night, Duck, all unbeknownst. Then Duck laughed, too. You win, Donald. It'd take a clever engine to get the better of you. There's a pond near the duckling station. Here she often swims and welcomes the trains as they pass by. The station master calls her Dilly, but to everyone else, she is always Donald's Duck. Thomas the tank engine was grumbling to the other engines. I spend my time pulling coaches about, ready for you to take out on journeys. The other engines laughed. Why can't I pull passenger trains too? You're too impatient, they said. You'd be sure to leave something behind. Rubbish, said Thomas. I'll show you. One night, he and Henry were alone. Henry was ill. The men worked hard, but he didn't get better. He felt just as bad next morning. Henry usually pulled the first train, and Thomas had to get his coaches ready. If Henry is ill, he thought, perhaps I shall pull his train. Thomas ran to find the coaches. Come along, come along, he fussed. There's plenty of time, there's plenty of time, they grumbled. Thomas took them to the platform and wanted to run round in front at once. But his driver wouldn't let him. Don't be impatient, Thomas. Thomas waited and waited. The people got in. The conductor and station master walked up and down. The porter banged the doors, and still Henry didn't come. Thomas got more and more excited. 
Sir Topham Hatt came to see what was the matter, and the conductor and station master told him about Henry. Find another engine, he ordered. There's only Thomas, they said. You'll have to do it then, Thomas. Be quick now. So Thomas ran round to the front and back down on the coaches, ready to start. Let's not be impatient, said his driver. We'll wait till everything is ready. But Thomas was too excited to listen. What happened then, no one knows. Perhaps they forgot to couple Thomas to the train, or perhaps the driver pulled the lever by mistake. Anyhow, Thomas started without his coaches. As he passed the first signal tower, men waved and shouted, but he didn't stop. They're waving because I'm such a splendid engine, he thought importantly. Henry says it's hard to pull trains, but I think it's easy. Hurry, 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 he puffed, pretending to be like Gordon. People have never seen me pulling a train before. It's nice of them to wave. And he whistled. Beep, beep. Thank you. Then he came to a signal at danger. Bother, he thought. I must stop. And I was going so nicely, too. What a nuisance signals are. He blew an angry beep, beep on his whistle. The signalman ran up. Hello, Thomas, he said. What are you doing here? I'm pulling a train, said Thomas. Can't you see? Where are your coaches, then? Thomas looked back. Why, bless me, he said, if we haven't left them behind. Yes, said the signalman. You'd better go back quickly and fetch them. Poor Thomas was so sad, he nearly cried. Cheer up, said his driver. Let's go back quickly and try again. At the station, all the passengers were talking at once. They were telling Sir Topham Hatt what a bad railway it was. But when Thomas came back, they saw how sad he was and couldn't be cross. He was coupled to the train, and this time he really pulled it. Afterwards, the other engines laughed at Thomas and said, Look, there's Thomas, who wanted to pull a train, but forgot about the coaches. But Thomas had already learned not to make the same mistake again. Thomas the tank engine wouldn't stop being a nuisance. Night after night, he kept the other engines awake. I'm tired of pushing coaches. I want to see the world. The other engines didn't take much notice, for Thomas was a little engine with a long tongue. But one night, Edward came to the shed. He was a kind little engine and felt sorry for Thomas. I've got some freight cars to take home tomorrow. If you take them instead of me, I'll push coaches in the yard. Thank you, said Thomas. That will be nice. Next morning, Edward and Thomas asked their drivers, and when they said yes, Thomas ran off happily to find freight cars. Now, the freight cars are silly and noisy. They talk a lot and don't attend to what they are doing. And I'm sorry to say they play tricks on an engine who is not used to them. Edward knew all about the freight cars. He warned Thomas to be careful, but Thomas was too excited to listen. The shunter fastened the coupling, and when the signal dropped, Thomas was ready. The conductor blew his whistle. Beep, beep, answered Thomas and started off. But the freight cars weren't ready. Oh, oh, they screamed. Wait, Thomas, wait. But Thomas wouldn't wait. Come on, come on, he puffed. All right, don't fuss. All right, don't fuss, grumbled the cars. Thomas began going faster and faster. Whee! He whistled, 
as he rushed through Henry's tunnel. Hurry, hurry, called Thomas. He was feeling very proud of himself. But the cars grew crosser and crosser. At last, Thomas slowed down as he came to Gordon's Hill. Steady now, steady, warned the driver as they reached the top. He began to put on the brakes. We're stopping, we're stopping, called Thomas. No, 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 answered the cars, bumping into each other. Go on, go on. Before the driver could stop them, they had pushed Thomas down the hill and were rattling and laughing behind him. Poor Thomas tried hard to stop them from making him go too fast. Stop pushing, stop pushing, he hissed. But the cars took no notice. Go on, go on, they giggled in their silly way. There's the station. Oh dear, what shall I do, cried Thomas. They rattled straight through and swerved into the goods yard. Thomas shut his eyes. I must stop. When he opened his eyes, he saw he had stopped just in front of the buffers. There, watching him, was Sir Topham Hatt. What are you doing here, Thomas? he asked. I've brought Edward's freight cars, Thomas answered. Why did you come so fast? I didn't mean to. I was pushed, said Thomas. You've got a lot to learn about freight cars, Thomas. After pushing them about here for a few weeks, you'll know almost as much about them as Edward. Then you'll be a really useful engine. Every day, Sir Topham Hatt came to the station to catch his train. Hello, he always said to Thomas. Don't let the silly freight cars tease you. Remember, you have an important job as a special helper in the train yard. There were lots of freight cars, and Thomas worked very hard pushing and pulling them into place. There was also a small coach and two strange things his driver called cranes. That's the breakdown train, he told Thomas. The cranes are for lifting heavy things like engines and coaches and freight cars. One day, Thomas was in the yard. Suddenly, he heard an engine whistling. Help, help! A freight train came rushing through much too fast. The engine was James and he was frightened. His brake blocks were on fire. They're pushing me, they're pushing me, he panted. On, on, laughed the freight cars, still whistling, help, help. Poor James disappeared. I'd like to teach those freight cars a lesson, said Thomas the tank engine. Soon came the alarm. James is off the line, the breakdown train, quickly. Thomas was coupled on and off they went. Thomas worked his hardest. Hurry, 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 he puffed. He wasn't pretending to be like Gordon. He really meant it. Bother those freight cars and their tricks. I hope poor James isn't hurt. James's driver and fireman were feeling him all over to see if he was hurt. Never mind, James, they said. It was those silly freight cars and your old wooden brakes that caused the accident. Thomas pushed the breakdown train alongside. Then he pulled away the unhurt freight cars. Oh dear, oh dear, they groaned. Serves you right, serves you right, puffed Thomas. He was hard at work puffing backwards and forwards all afternoon. 
This'll teach you a lesson, this'll teach you a lesson, he told the freight cars. And they answered, yes, it will, yes, it will. They left the broken cars, then with two cranes, they put James back on the rails. He tried to move, but he couldn't, so Thomas helped him back to the shed. <coughs> Sir Topham Hatt was waiting anxiously for them. Well, Thomas, he said, I've heard all about it, and I'm very pleased with you. You're a really useful engine. James shall have some proper brakes and a new coat of paint, and you shall have a branch line all to yourself. Oh, thank you, sir, said Thomas. Now Thomas is as happy as can be. He has a branch line and two coaches called Annie and Clarabelle. He puffs proudly backwards and forwards with them all day. He is never lonely. Edward and Henry stop quite often and tell him the news. Gordon is always in a hurry, but never forgets to say boop, boop, and Thomas always whistles beep, beep in return. Toby is a tram engine. He has cow catchers and side plates and doesn't look like a steam engine at all. He takes freight cars from farms and villages to the main line and is cheerful to everyone he meets. He has a coach called Henrietta who has seen better days. It's not fair at all, she grumbles, remembering that she used to be full and nine cars would rattle behind her. Now there are only three or four, for the farms and factories send their goods mostly by truck. Toby is always careful. The cars, buses, and trucks often have accidents. Toby hasn't had an accident for years, but the buses are crowded and Henrietta is empty. A lady and a stout gentleman stood on Toby's platform. He was, of course, Sir Topham Hatt, but Toby didn't know this yet. Come on, Grandfather, cried the children. Do look at this engine. That's a tram engine, Stephen, said Sir Topham Hatt. Is it electric? asked Bridget. Whoosh! hissed Toby. Shh! said her brother. You've offended him. But trams are electric, aren't they? They are mostly, but this is a steam tram. May we go in it, Grandfather, please? Stop! said Sir Topham Hatt to the conductor. They all scrambled into Henrietta. Hip, hip, hooray! chanted Henrietta. But Toby didn't sing. Electric indeed, electric indeed, he snorted. He was proud of being a steam train. What is your name? asked Sir Topham Hatt. Toby, sir. Thank you, Toby, for a very nice ride. Thank you, sir, said Toby. He felt better now. This gentleman, he thought, is a gentleman who knows how to speak to engines. The children came every day for two weeks. Sometimes they rode with the conductor, sometimes in empty cars. On the last day of all, the driver invited them into his cab. All were sorry when they had to go away. 
and Sir Topham Hatt and his family thanked everyone. Come again soon, replied Toby. We will, we will, called the children. And they waved till Toby was out of sight. The months passed. Toby had few cars and fewer passengers. Our last day, Toby, said his driver one morning. The manager says we must close tomorrow. That day, everyone wanted the chance of a last ride. The passengers joked and sang, but Toby and his driver wished they wouldn't. Goodbye, Toby, said the passengers afterwards. We're sorry your line is closing down. So am I, said Toby. Nobody wants me, Toby thought, and went unhappily to sleep. Next morning, the shed was flung open, and old Toby woke with a start to see his driver waving a piece of paper at him. Wake up, Toby, he shouted excitedly. The mail has just arrived, and there is a letter for us from the stout gentleman. Maybe it's good news. Toby and Henrietta were enjoying their new job on the island of Sodor, but they do look old-fashioned and did need new paint. James was very rude whenever he saw them. Yick! What dirty objects, he would say. At last, Toby lost patience. James, he asked, why are you red? I am a splendid engine, answered James, ready for anything. You never see my paint dirty. Oh, said Toby innocently, that's why you once needed bootlaces, to be ready, I suppose. James went redder than ever and snorted off. It was such an insult to be reminded of the time a bootlace had been used to mend a hole in his coaches. At the end of the line, James left his coaches and got ready for his next train. It was a slow freight, stopping at every station to pick up and set down cars. James hated slow freight trains. Dirty cars from dirty siding. Yeah! Starting with only a few, he picked up more and more cars at each station till he had a long train. At first, the freight cars behaved well, but James bumped them so crossly that they were determined to get back at him. Presently, they approached the top of Gordon's Hill. Heavy freight trains halt here to set their brakes. James had had an accident with cars before and should have remembered this. Wait, James, wait, said the driver, but James wouldn't wait. He was too busy thinking what he would say to Toby when they next met. The freight car's chance had come. Hurrah, hurrah, they laughed, and banging their buffers, they pushed him down the hill. On, on, yelled the cars. I've got to stop, I've got to stop groaned James. Disaster lay ahead. Something sticky splashed all over James. He had run into two tar wagons and was black from smoke box to cab. He was more dirty than hurt but the tar wagons and some cars were all to pieces. Toby and Percy were sent to help and came as quickly as they could. Look here, Percy, exclaimed Toby. 
Whatever is that dirty object? That's James, didn't you know? It's James's shape, said Toby. But James is a splendid red engine, and you never see his paint dirty. James pretended he hadn't heard. Toby and Percy cleared away the unhurt cars and helped James home. Sir Topham Hatt met them. Well done, Percy and Toby. He turned to James. Fancy letting your cars run away. I am surprised. You're not fit to be seen. You must be cleaned at once. Toby shall have a new coat of paint. Please, sir, can Henrietta have one too? said Toby. Certainly, Toby. Oh, thank you, sir. She will be pleased. All James could do was watch Toby as he ran off happily with the news. It was winter on the island of Sodor. Peter Sam puffed nervously along the line. His funnel had never been the same since his accident with some cars. Now the biting wind was trying to blow it away. My funnel feels wobbly, he complained. I wish manager would hurry up with my new one. He says it will be something special. You and your special funnel, laughed the other engines. They were fond of Peter Sam, but his special funnel had become quite a joke. The winter wind grew worse. The rain came, too, turning hillside streams into torrents, which threatened to wash the line away. Rusty, the little diesel, worked hard carrying workmen up and down the line. They were removing branches and leaves so water could flow away. But one morning, Rusty's driver brought bad news. There's been a washout near the tunnel. The track bed has been swept away. We must repair the damage immediately. The important work took longer than expected. As days went by, the weather changed. It became frosty and much colder. The workmen finished at last. Peter Sam was most careful as he took the morning train over the mended piece of track. Soon he approached the tunnel. It was short and curved, so his driver could not see right through it. Peter Sam was heading for trouble. There's something hanging from the roof, shouted his driver. Peter Sam came out of the tunnel a different looking engine. He no longer had his funnel. Here's what hit you, Peter Sam, called the conductor, and he produced a thick, cold icicle. They set off again, but without his funnel, the journey was very difficult. Then his fireman saw an old drain pipe lying beside the track. We'll use that instead of your funnel. At least it'll help control the smoke. Peter Sam finished his journey with the drain pipe wired to his boiler. The other engines laughed, and Sir Handel sang a song about it. Peter Sam said again and again, his new funnel will put us to shame. Went into the tunnel and lost his old funnel. Now his famous new funnel's a drain. The teasing continued until at last the day came when his new funnel arrived. Sir Topham Hatt proudly presented it. 
Oh dear, someone squashed it, said Peter Sam, but Sir Topham Hat laughed. Don't worry, Peter Sam. This funnel is something special indeed. You'll soon see. Peter Sam's new funnel had special pipes which made puffing much easier. I feel stronger than ever before, he hummed. Even Sir Handel was impressed. I can't understand it. Peter Sam just seems to stroll along the line. He makes work look so easy. The engines don't laugh at Peter Sam's funnel now. They wish they had one like it. Henry and Gordon were lonely when Thomas left the yard to run his branch line. They missed him very much. They had more work to do and had to fetch their own coaches. The big engines thought they were too important to fetch coaches. James grumbled too. We get no rest, we get no rest, they all complained. But the coaches only laughed. You're lazy and slack, you're lazy and slack, they answered. Altogether, the engines were causing Sir Topham Hatt a great deal of trouble. The big stations at both ends of the line each have a turntable. Sir Topham Hatt had made them so that the tender engines can be turned round because it is dangerous for them to go fast backwards. Little tank engines like Thomas don't need turntables. They can go just as well backwards as forwards. But to hear Gordon talk, you would have thought that Sir Topham Hatt had given him a tender just to show how important he was. You don't understand, little Thomas. We tender engines have a position to keep up. It doesn't matter where you go, but we are important. And for Sir Topham Hatt to make us do shunting, fetch coaches, and go on some of those dirty sidings, it's, it's, well, it's not the proper thing. Thomas chuckled and went off with Annie and Clarabelle. Disgraceful, Gordon hissed as he ran backwards to the turntable. The turntable was in a windy place close to the sea, and if he was not on it just right, he put it out of balance and made it difficult to turn. Today, Gordon was in a bad temper, and the wind was blowing fiercely. His driver tried to make him stop in the right place, but Gordon wasn't trying. The fireman tried to turn the handle, but Gordon's weight and the strong wind prevented him. It's no good, they said at last. Your big tender upsets the balance. If you were a little tank engine, you'd be all right. Now you'll have to pull the next train backwards. Look, called some boys. There's a new tank engine. Oh, it's only Gordon back to front. Hello, called Thomas. Playing tank engines? Sensible engine. Take my advice. Scrap your tender and have a nice bunker. Gordon said nothing. Even James laughed when he saw him. Take care, hissed Gordon. You might stick too. No fear, chuckled James. I'm not so fat as you. I mustn't stick, thought James. He stopped on just the right place to balance the table. It could now swing easily. Gordon arrived in time to see everything. James turned much too easily. The wind puffed him round like a top. He couldn't stop. Well, well, said Gordon. Are you playing roundabouts? Poor James, feeling quite giddy, rolled off to the shed without a word. That night, the three engines had an indignation meeting. It's shameful to treat tender engines like this. Gordon has to go backwards, and people think he's a tank engine. James spins round like a top, and everyone laughs at us. And to add to that, Sir Topham Hatt makes us all shunt in dirty sidings. Ugh! Listen. <laughs>
said Gordon. He whispered something to the others. We'll do it tomorrow. Sir Topham Hatt will look silly. The engines had decided to go on strike. Sir Topham Hatt sat in his office listening to the noise outside. The passengers were angry. The station master came in. There's trouble in the shed, sir. Henry is sulking. There's no train, and the passengers are saying this is a bad railway. Indeed, said Sir Tom Hatt. We cannot allow that. He found Gordon, James, and Henry looking very cross. Come along, Henry. It's time your train was ready. Henry's not going, said Gordon. We won't shunt like little tank engines. That was Thomas's job. We're important tender engines. You fetch our coaches and we will pull them. Tender engines don't shunt. We'll see about that, said Sir Topham Hatt. No engine on my railway is too important for small jobs. And he hurried away to find Edward. The yard has never been the same since Thomas left to run his branch line, he thought sadly. Edward was shunting. Leave those freight cars, please, Edward, said Sir Topham Hatt. I want you to push coaches for me in the yard. Thank you, sir. That will be a nice change. That's a good engine. Off you go, then. So Edward found coaches for the three engines, and that day the trains ran as usual. But next morning, Edward looked unhappy. Gordon came clanking past, hissing rudely. Bless me, said Sir Topham Hatt. What a noise! They all hiss me, sir, answered Edward. They say tender engines don't shunt. And last night they said I have gray wheels. I haven't, have I, sir? No, Edward, you have nice blue ones, and I'm proud of you. Tender engines do shunt. But all the same, we do need another tank engine here. He went to a workshop, and they showed him all sorts of engines. At last, he saw a smart little green engine with four wheels. That's the one, he thought. If I choose you, will you work hard? Oh, sir. Yes, sir. That's a good engine. I'll call you Percy. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. And Sir Topham Hatt brought Percy back to the yard. Edward, he called. Here's Percy. Will you show him everything? Percy soon learned what he had to do, and they had a happy afternoon. Then Henry came by, hissing as usual. Whee! went Percy. Henry jumped and ran back to the shed. How beautifully you wished him, laughed Edward. I can't wish like that. Oh, said Percy, that's nothing. You should hear them in the workshop. You have to wheesh loudly to make yourself heard. Next morning, Thomas arrived. Sir Topham Hatt sent for me. I expect he wants help, he said to Edward. Shh, shh, here he comes, replied Edward. Well done, Thomas. You've been quick. Listen, Henry Gordon and James are sulking. They say they won't shunt like little tank engines. So I have shut them up and I want you both to run the line for a while. Little tank engines indeed, snorted Thomas. We'll show them. And Percy will help too. Oh, sir, yes, sir, please, sir, answered Percy. Edward and Thomas worked the main line, greeting each other as they passed by. Percy puffed along the branch line. Thomas was anxious about Annie and Clarabelle, but both driver and conductor promised to take care of them. There were fewer trains, but the passengers didn't mind. They knew the three other engines were having a lesson. Gordon, James, and Henry were cold, lonely, and miserable. They wished now they hadn't been so silly. Henry, James, and Gordon were miserable. They had been shut up for several days for being naughty and longed to be let out again. At last, Sir Topham had arrived. 
I hope you are sorry, he said, and that you understand that every job on the railway is important. We have a new tank engine called Percy, who helps pull coaches, and Thomas and Edward have worked the main line nicely. But I will let you out now if you promise to work hard. Yes, sir, said the three engines. We will. That's good. But please remember that this no-shunting nonsense must stop. So Topham Hatt then told Percy, Edward, and Thomas that they could go and play on the branch line for a few days. And they ran off happily to find Annie and Clarabelle at the junction. The two coaches were very pleased to see Thomas again. Edward and Percy played with the freight cars. Stop, 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 screamed the cars as they were pushed into their proper sidings. But the two engines laughed and went on shunting till the cars were tidily arranged. Next, Edward took some empty cars to the quarry. Percy was left alone. He didn't mind that a bit. He liked watching trains and being cheeky to the other engines. Hurry, 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 he would call, and they got very cross. After a great deal of shunting, Percy was waiting for the signalman to set the switch so he could get back to the yard. Percy was being rather careless and not paying attention. Edward had warned Percy, be careful on the main line, whistle to the signalman that you were there. But Percy didn't remember to whistle, and so the busy signalman forgot him. Percy waited and waited. The switch was still against him, so he couldn't move. Then he looked along the main line. Beep, beep, he whistled in horror, for rushing straight toward him was Gordon with the express. Oh, groaned Gordon. Get out of my way! Percy opened his eyes. Gordon had stopped with Percy's buffers just a few inches from his own. But Percy had begun to move. I won't stay here. I'll run away, he puffed. He went straight through Edward's station and was so frightened that he ran right up Gordon's hill without stopping. Tired, but he couldn't stop. He had no driver to shut off steam and apply the brakes. I want to stop! I want to stop! He puffed. The man in the signal box saw Percy was in trouble, so he kindly set the switch. Percy puffed wearily onto a nice empty siding, ending in a big bank of earth. He was too tired now to care where he went. I want to stop! I want to stop! I have stopped, he puffed thankfully. Never mind, Percy, said the workman as they dug him out. You shall have a drink and some coal, and then you'll feel better. Presently, Gordon arrived. Well done, Percy. You started so quickly that you stopped a nasty accident. I'm sorry I was cheeky, said Percy. You were clever to stop, replied Gordon. Then Gordon helped pull Percy out from the bank. The two engines are now good friends, but Percy is always most careful when he goes out on the main line.